So um, hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, good morning. So we're going to be starting our third lesson together. Um, and I, I sent yesterday, I hope you guys received it already on Slack, the second whiteboard from our lesson of yesterday. And I forgot to add on to it this, uh, some stuff that I, I mentioned I would. So instead, it's uh, here at the beginning of the third lecture. So when we get the third whiteboard um, later today, you'll be able to have this. So as I said, just um, some additional references for, um, for two to two. Uh, for the two to two zoo that um, that we're not covering in detail in this lecture, as well as some additional resources of um, uh, nice notes or um, like lecture recordings that um, that I find might be useful, might give you sort of a, a complimentary take on some of the stuff that we haven't gone into as much detail in. Um, and also here in the center is uh, um, somebody had asked a question, I think it was at the end of the first lesson about the chemical potentials. Um, so just sort of wanted to, um, I said I was gonna give that equation and the explanation. So I just wanted to make sure that I, I give you everything that I owe. Um, and with that, we're gonna start our, our third lecture together. And let me just remind you where, um, where we left off yesterday. So um, what we finished uh, talking about yesterday, we went over um, three to two processes and we talked about simp dark matter. And we, uh, we certainly saw that um, we were talking about two processes that we had, which looked on um, the following way. So here was our three to two simp process where three chi's were annihilating into two chi's. Um, and then we simultaneously said that it was really important that we have some process through which we're dumping entropy. So for instance, we could have chi's elastically scattering off of some bath particles. And uh, the place that we left off was with understanding that for the simp, the three to two process is what's responsible for freeze out and it's the thing that decouples first. Well, uh, the elastic scattering has to be active while freeze out is occurring. And so this is a process that decouples second. And the question that we started asking was what would happen if the order was reversed? Okay. And the way that we're uh, going to work our way uh, to this is by first, sorry about that, is by um, first working through cannibals. Okay, so I'm gonna explain what I mean by, um, by cannibals. And maybe just, uh, sorry, actually before, before this, I probably should have um, mentioned, so just to give you our brief outline for today. So we're gonna be talking about, as I said, we're gonna start with our cannibals. Um, we're then gonna move to talk about elders. Um, and we're gonna talk about another candidate, which I'll call Indies. And after that, we're gonna start dark sectors. Okay, so these are still um, sort of leftovers that I wanna cover, not leftovers, but different various aspects of mechanisms that we're gonna be covering together. And then we're gonna start talking about model building and start discussion about dark sectors. So that's, um, that's our outline for today. And with that, let's move to cannibals, okay? So uh, here we are at cannibals. Cannibalism, okay. So um, the original idea for this, uh, I'll give you this uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful reference, um, was by a paper by Carlson Machakek, whose name I'm probably awfully mispronouncing, and uh, Hall in 1992. And so um, here's the idea. Let's look back at, sorry for scrolling, let's look back over here at, um, at our three to two process, okay? Now, uh, as we said, for SIMPs to emerge, we really had to have this entropy dump process be active. And uh, the question that I want to ask is, what if such a process didn't exist? Okay, what if we didn't have light abundant um, particles available for us to dump our entropy into? And before I continue, I'm just noticing that my video, are you guys also seeing my video going a little, a little quirky? Yeah, okay, so let me just, whoop, let's try this crocodile. Let's see if that uh, if it behaves better. Okay. Um, so uh, so for this three to two process, uh, the question I want to ask is what would happen if we didn't have light abundant species with which we could uh, interact into which we could dump our entropy. So look at our three to two, and we ask ourselves, what if we don't have light abundant species to dump entropy into. 
Okay, so this could happen either because um, you know we don't have any additional the light set the dark sector doesn't have any additional light degrees of freedom that are abundant, or uh, we have some mass gap in our system. Um, and so if this is the case, then if there's no way for me to dump my entropy, um, then there's no reason for the temperature to be the same temperature in the dark sector as it is in the standard model, right? If I disconnect these two sectors from each other, then there's no reason for having one temperature that's describing the whole system. So there's no reason for um, having the same temperature as the standard model. So what would happen in, uh, in this case? So if I'm having these three to two interactions, okay, now I'm just having these chi's annihilating into, um, uh, three chi's annihilating into two chi's, then uh, as the dark matter becomes non-relativistic, what's happening is that this three to two process is converting the mass energy of one of those particles into kinetic energy of, um, uh, um, of the other particles. And then my resulting particles after this annihilation are now relativistic, and then they're going to sort of quickly scatter with themselves and redistribute, uh, redistribute that energy. And so basically what I'm doing is converting, um, I'm sort of pumping heat into the system, and this is something that's heating up my bath, okay? And that's gonna raise the temperature of, these, uh, of this dark matter. So this is what's called cannibalism, which was uh, the term that was uh, uh, given to this idea um, in this paper from 1992. And the idea is literally that these chi's, our dark matter, are eating themselves up in order to stay warm. Okay, that's the, um, that's the origin of this name. So the chi's eat themselves um, in order to stay warm. Okay, so that's the sense in which these are, uh, this is a cannibal process. Um, and of course, what we can ask ourselves, and this is going to be important, is how much do they heat up? How much? Do they heat up? So, uh, so let's walk through that. So if I have chi's that are just interacting with themselves, okay? I don't have any, I'm not, I don't have any other light abundant particles that I'm speaking with. So if they're only talking to themselves, then amongst themselves, their co-moving entropy is conserved, right? That's, that's sort of by definition. So if our chi's don't talk to anyone else, then um, uh, our co-moving entropy is conserved. And so if I think of, so that's like uh, S of chi times A cubed equals constant, okay? Now, what is the, uh, what is the entropy density of, um, of the dark matter particles? Well, that's just given by, um, sorry, the, the entropy density is given by the energy density plus the pressure divided by the temperature. And we're looking in a regime where these particles are now non-relativistic, so I can neglect the pressure. And so this just equals rho chi over T chi. So if they're non-relativistic, the energy density is just um, the mass times the number density. So here's M chi times N chi over their temperature. Okay. Number density, again, I'm reminding you, we're talking about non-relativistic. So the number density is just um, an exponent, uh, is that non-relativistic. Uh, number density that we wrote out in our first time in our first lesson together. So this is m chi over t chi, which I've just copied over. And now the number density goes like mass times temperature over, there's probably some two pi here, three halves. That part's not really important. What is important is that I have e to the minus m chi over t chi. And so now I'm requiring that all of this goes like one over a cubed because s times a cubed equals constant. A goes like one over temperature. And so what we find at the end of the day here is that the conservation of entropy implies the following, that the temperature of the dark matter is gonna scale like one over the logarithm of the scale factor. You see, so this is all sourced by the fact that we have here, um, you know, here's my temperature sitting in this exponent, okay? And so, um, and so we have a temperature that's going to scale like uh, one over log of a, which is the same as one over log of one over t, because a scales like one over t, where this is the t of the photon. Okay, and so what you see over here is that the temperature of the dark matter is growing exponentially compared to the temperature of the standard model bath. Okay, that's what we've just arrived at. 
that the dark matter temperature is growing exponentially compared to the standard model bath. Okay. And so we have a dark sector that's getting exponentially hotter compared to uh, the growth of the standard model temperature. And we can also uh, take this and estimate what would be the abundance of, if this was, if we have these three to two interactions with no ability to shed the heat, so we're cannibalizing, the temperature is getting hotter and hotter, and we can understand what is the expected abundance of this process, okay? So we can also estimate um, the abundance. So uh, for that, let me just uh, write out the following thing. So let's look at the combination of the mass of the dark matter times its number density today divided by, its, uh, by the entropy density today. And so this, again, we're going to use our redshift uh, tricks. So I can redshift, um, I can redshift from today back to the point of freeze out. So let's do that. So this is going to look like m chi, n chi at freeze out over s at freeze out. And because we're talking about um, non-relativistic particles, then instead of mass times n, I can just write down temperature times entropy. So this is going to be the temperature of chi at freeze out times the uh, entropy density at freeze out divided by the entropy density of the standard model at freeze out. Okay. And so now let's um, let's use this and insert it into the uh, uh, the abundance of dark matter. So omega of dark matter, which is defined to be you know the the um, the mass of dark matter times the number density of dark matter today over uh, the critical row. So this equals. Let's use our previous line. So this is just equal to. Um, oops, let me erase this. Okay. So what I'm going to use now? Let me give this equation some name. Okay. I'm going to use this this equation, this pink star. Okay. So I'm going to use pink star equation and plug this in. And what I'm going to get is that this equals to. T chi freeze out, S chi freeze out over S of freeze out. And I have to copy over from here, one over rho critical, okay, times S naught. So let's write that over here, okay? And when you plug in numbers, what you find for this is 0 0.6 M chi in units of EV over X chi at freeze out times S chi at freeze out over S at freeze out, okay? Now, why is this uh, why is this important? So this is what we get. Here's our abundance for the case of three to two annihilations without the ability to shed heat when we're cannibalizing. So you see that uh, in order to get the right abundance that should be of order point, uh, point 0.27, what this would imply is that our dark matter has to be super super light. Okay, it has to be of order EV-ish, unless there's some uh, you know big difference of uh, uh, big difference that's coming in in terms of the ratio of these um, of the entropy density at freeze out between the two sectors, which would have to come in through some you know big difference of number of degrees of freedom. So unless we play tricks of that sort, what we get, which one could do, um, but in general, this sort of uh, generically would tell you that you're going to have super light dark matter, unless um, you have a huge, either huge temperature difference or number of degrees of freedom difference. Okay. But this predicts very light dark matter. And this is uh, the story for, uh, for cannibal dark matter. And when this was first proposed in, uh, in the early 1990s, um, it was actually sort of viewed as a feature because this light dark matter, which is in the regime of what we call warm, uh, warm dark matter, um, which affects structure formation. Um, at the time, it was thought that, this, that there were some hints in structure formation that were pointing towards wanting to have warm dark matter. But then a couple of years later, um, uh, new analysis showed that actually you don't want the warm dark matter. So this is uh, this is really something that would lead to problems with structure formation. Um, and so for many years, uh, this sort of this cannibal this cannibal picture was really um, was really put aside. Um, and again, simps take this but remove the cannibalization um, by having this entropy dump. But what I want us now to discuss is how we can move from cannibals into elder into uh, a different a different type of dark matter candidate. So um, let's now go from cannibals to elders. Okay. So what we've just seen together for the case of cannibals is that if we have a bath of particles 
that are undergoing these three chi's to two chi annihilations, we have cannibalization. Okay, so this is what we just saw that a bath of particles, um, particles chi that are undergoing chi, chi, chi goes to two chi's um, processes. This undergoes cannibalization. Okay. Now let's suppose within this uh, within this story, let's suppose that it's sometime before the three to two process is freezing out that the bath was in equilibrium in uh, with the standard model. Okay, and it decoupled at some temperature. So let me write that out. So suppose that at some time, okay, in its history, before three to two um, fro freezes out, that this bath of chi particles was in um, thermal equilibrium, thermal equilibrium, with the standard model and it decoupled at some point and we'll call that temperature um, this is the temperature at which so i'll, I'll have a little sub index d which is going to indicate that decoupling temperature between the two sectors and this is uh we'll call this is the temperature at which um the standard model temperature equals that of the dark sector okay and afterwards they're no longer in thermal contact and the temperatures start uh you know start start to start being different start undergoing the cannibalization Okay, so I'm going to denote that with this uh, with this little d for decoupling. Okay, so that's the moment of decoupling. Now um, let's take a look at uh, at the following. So if we uh, if we look at we have if we look at our uh, relic abundance for dark matter that we derived just now for the cannibal case, we have this ratio over here. Let me just we have this ratio over here of s ratios of entropy. At the time of freeze out between the dark sector and the um, and the standard model, right? And so this uh, this ratio, okay, this is exactly what I'm going to write down over here. Um, this ratio at freeze out, oh, sorry, oops, ratio of s chi at freeze out to s of the standard model at freeze out. Um, this just equals to uh, these same val to the ratio of these two sectors at decoupling, because once they've decoupled, everything is just redshifting, um, redshifting the same, okay? And so what this means is that what I can now write for this uh, equation we have up here, this one over here, is that um, I can now replace that with omega chi equals 0.6 m chi over EV divided by x of chi at freeze out. But now let me replace this with x chi decoupling over s decoupling. Okay, all I've done is use the fact that I can replace this entropy ratio with the entropy ratio at the time of decoupling. And now let's take a look and see what does this thing over here equal. Okay, so uh, let's write that out over here. So S chi at decoupling over S at decoupling. Um, so there are two possibilities for how uh, for how it might scale. Okay, so if the temperature of decoupling is very very high. And the dark matter is not, is relativistic, then uh, there's nothing interesting happening over here. This is just sort of an order one factor. Or um, uh, so, so let me write that here. So if T of decoupling is much much larger than the mass of the dark matter, then the dark matter is relativistic. And then the entropy ratio is just uh, is just order ones or some ratio of number of degrees of freedom freedom. Okay or uh, some, some ratio of you know, degrees of freedom g chi over degrees of freedom. Uh, um, anyway, just, let me just write that, sorry. Or let's do it like this, or ratio of degrees of freedom. Okay, but not, not anything uh, very large or very small. So that's what happens if it's relativistic, but what happens if it's non-relativistic? Okay, so if the, if the temperature at which the sector is decoupled, which is happening very early on, is happening when the dark matter is non-relativistic, then in this case, the entropy density in the uh, in the dark sector is actually exponentially suppressed. And we're going to get something that's going to look like some numbers that I'm going to be sloppy with, m chi over t decoupling to the 5 over 2 power e to the minus m chi over td. OK, and the only thing that we care about over here is that we have this exponential suppression. OK, um, and so to understand what this means, let's also understand so right now we have that our dark matter density is exponentially dependent on the temperature of decoupling, 
let's figure out what is that temperature at which the things decouple, okay? So uh, that's what we're gonna do now. When do the sectors decouple? So they decouple whenever that elastic scattering that was coupling them stops happening, right? So this happens when the elastic scattering chi, let's say photons, the chi photons or whatever particle it is within the standard model um, that it's talking with stops, okay? So let's use our estimating tools to understand when does this decoupling occur. So what I have here is, um, so again, if I'm, a, if I'm a dark matter particle, okay, so here I am, I'm a dark matter particle. So the rate for the elastic scattering is proportional to the number density of photons or number density of these light standard model species, right? Because I have to meet uh, a photon, for instance, in order for this to happen. Um, so this part, okay, so this part over here is coming about because we have to meet a standard model particle. Okay, so this is uh, exactly in the, the, using the same, um, the same logic that we've been using throughout. And then it's times the strength of whatever this elastic scattering cross section is, right? This is the rate for the elastic process. And it's gonna decouple when this is of order Hubble. So this is gonna be T decoupling squared over M Planck. And so uh, number density of photons is just roughly, um, oops, T cubed, right? Cause these are relativistic particles. So I have here a T cubed times sigma V, oops, sigma V elastic. And this should equal TD squared over M Planck. And so now I just shift around. And what I find is that my elastic scattering cross section scales like one over TD M Planck, which is the same as M chi over TD um, one over M chi uh, M Planck. Okay, so all I've done here is just insert um, a factor of M upstairs and a factor of M downstairs so that you can see that this uh, over here, going back to this, uh, this blue factor over here, okay, we're at e to the minus M chi over TD. So here's my M chi over TD. And so what you see is that instead of writing exponent of that, I can write down exponent of my elastic scattering cross section. Okay, so let's put all of these pieces, all of these pieces together. So hopefully we'll have a, a consistent picture. What we found all together is that if I look at what is the relic abundance of dark matter, well, it is proportional, and we've worked out all of the proportionality factors, but it's proportional to e to the minus sigma v elastic times stuff, okay? And so what we have found over here is that we now have a dark matter candidate, a mechanism in which the relic abundance of dark matter is determined by the elastic scattering cross-section, okay? So this is dark matter relic abundance is determined by elastic, elastic scattering process, okay? The relic abundance cares the most about a process that's not even changing the number of dark matter particles in the universe. Okay, this is a number change. This is not a number changing process. This is an elastic scattering process. And yet we've arrived at a, at a candidate where the dark matter density is dependent on this, uh, this, this number conserving process. Okay, so this is what's called an elastically decoupling relic or in short, an elder. Um, and, and I'll just say, by the way, this, uh, this estimate that we did over here of, you know, what is the elastic scattering cross section, you can make this more accurate by instead of just uh, considering the rate for the process, he's actually looking at the rate of the energy transfer. Um, and you can find this in, uh, uh, in the literature um, and I'll give you the reference in a moment. Um, so you can make this even more, um, even more accurate, but this, uh, this easy estimate that we just did together really captures um, uh, sort of the bulk of the bulk of the physics in this case. So let me just uh, show you what, what this would mean. Okay, so sort of putting the picture together, what is that sort of freeze out um, picture that I want you to keep in mind over here? So again, let's look at the number density um, over, uh, over entropy density. So this is our yield. And we look as a function of X, which is M chi over temperature. Okay, so here's, here's what's happening. At the very early universe, we have um, 
the two sectors are thermalized, okay, and there's nothing very interesting that's happening. So over here we are thermalized with the standard model. And then we reach some point in time, which is our decoupling temperature, okay? So this is uh, uh, X decoupling. This is what we call decoupling, okay? This is the point in which the two sectors are no longer uh, in thermal contact. This is the point at which this elastic scattering, chi with some photon or something like that, um, to chi phi um, decouples. Okay, this is the point where we've stopped interacting with the standard model and being in thermal contact. And then um, under dark matter at this point has entered the cannibal regime. And so dark matter is uh, over here being a cannibal. Okay, so here's where cannibalization is happening. And then at some point, uh, this is where our three to two is happening, right? And then at some point we reach the temperature at which our three to two process is um, is stopping to happen. So this is where well, this is our freeze out point. Um, so let's just mark that off over here. This is where our chi 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 to chi chi stops happening, and then we are just left with a constant uh, relic abundance over here where we're frozen out. Okay. So this is um, the picture for uh, elder dark matter. And just to give you um, a sense, again, the numbers over here. So actually this turns out you usually decouple it around um, X of 10 and freeze out here happens a little bit later um, at around a factor of 100, okay? And so putting, um, putting this picture together, what, we, what we've basically uh, seen is that if we look at these two processes, which I've drawn a few times, so we have chi chi, chi going to two chi's, and we've had our uh, elastic scattering cross-section of this sort, then um, as we've defined our SIMPs, or when this decouples first and this decouples second, and in contrast, when we reverse the order where we first decouple our elastic scattering, and we only then decouple at a later point um, our three to two annihilations, then we've arrived at elastically decoupling relics, okay? And uh, this idea was, uh, uh, I'll give you the references, so this idea was put forward in, uh, so the Elder idea is a nice, paper, nice set of papers by Kufflik, Perelstein, et al. Um, so there's a PRL, which is 1512.04545. And then there's um, another uh, longer paper with more phenomenology also, which is 1706.05381. Okay, and this is really um, a beautiful example of how even though we're we can have dark matter that's a thermal relic, that's number density that um, whose uh, relic abundance can be determined by a completely number conserving process. Okay, and in fact, it turns out that if you just think of sort of uh, if I look now at these two diagrams, right? So I have these two processes, and they're governed by different couplings. Okay, one of them is governed by a self coupling of dark matter, and one of them is governed by a coupling of dark matter to the standard model. And so actually, if we just um, sort of uh, um, think of this as, um, uh, as sort of looking at the parameter space of these couplings, okay? If we just look at the ratio, at the relative size of these two couplings that are involved, so let's just draw that over here. Here we go. Um, so let's look over here on the x-axis. Let's write down our dark matter standard model interaction. Okay, so this is the two to two process two to two diagram that I've drawn here uh, on the right compared to on the y-axis, these three to two self, um, self interactions. Then it turns out that as we flow in this parameter space, depending on the relative size of these couplings, we actually flow in dark matter space from a regime where dark matter is wimp-like to a regime where it's a simp to a regime where it's an elder. Okay, so down here, um, this is the region where we have, um, this is a region where we have something that's wimp-like so the dark matter number density, uh, sorry, uh, relic density is being dominated by chi chi's that are going into standard model, standard model. So this is the, the first mechanism that we've ever discussed together. But then as I continue to flow, I enter a regime where dark matter is simplic and the relic abundance is actually being determined by these interactions that are entirely between dark matter particles. And finally, when I move, uh, when we move up, we actually enter the elder regime, the elastically decoupling relic, where the density 
of dark matter is actually the relic abundance is determined by this elastic scattering off of standard model particles. Okay, and so uh, what we really have over here is by by exploring these questions of how do I move, you know, how do I, what happens if if I include more than one process? What happens if one is more important than the other? What happens if the point at which they decouple is reversed? What we've actually been able to establish is a really beautiful phase diagram that shows us that these theories, these concepts, these mechanisms are actually related to each other, um, sort of in a way that um, when people were just looking uh, just around the WIMP or just around the SIMP, when we look at each one individually, we sometimes uh, might miss uh, a bigger picture that, um, that exists. Are there, any, uh, are there any questions about cannibals or elders before we move to another candidate? Okay. Yes, Tim. Yeah, hi. Um, I have a question. I think when you go up to the last plot about the decoupling of the elders. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. There we see that in the, as I understood, the cannibalization, uh, the three to two process is active until the freeze out all the time before. Mm -hmm. So I would have expected naively also here in the first third that the number density drops. And this doesn't happen because dark matter is produced by the standard model in the thermal equilibrium with the standard model, or what is the reason for this? Yeah, so when I'm, when I'm thermalized with the standard model, you know, until the point, all of this is happening at the early times, um, things are when when things are relativistic. Um, when things are relativistic, then everything is rapidly happening in all directions, right? Um, once it becomes non-relativistic, then uh, you can think of it. There's going to be a region where the, it's going to start drop. Your number density will stop dropping. So I don't mean that it's completely flat. I just mean there's sort of there's a at very early on you're following equilibrium. Once you become non-relativistic, you're continuing to follow equilibrium. But then once uh, once the decoupling stops, then you're starting to cannibalize. So you're not falling at the same pace. You're cannibalizing, okay? And then and then you freeze out. So you really have these sort of distinct regimes where things are following equilibrium distribution. Then you're cannibalizing, and then you're freezing out. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, any other questions? So um, the next can, uh, the next and actually last candidate that we're uh, that we're going to work through together. Okay, so so far we've seen uh, we've seen wimps, and we've seen forbidden. We've seen co annihilations. Um, we've talked about three to two interactions or n to two. We've talked about simps, cannibals, and elders. And I just want to throw out one more topology um, into this uh, uh, into this um, into this picture, um, which is uh, going to be inverse decays. So that's going to be the this is going to be the last candidate that we speak about before we start going into, or the last mechanism that we're going to talk about before we start delving into dark sectors um, and um, and working through models. So uh, this is going to be a candidate, which um, something that we actually worked out uh, very recently, which is called I'm going to call it Indy dark matter. And we're going to see exactly um, exactly what it is. And one of the reasons that I think it's um, it's also really really nice is that if you just look at this uh, this phase diagram that we've just drawn here um, for the case of these simp, wimp, and elder, we saw that when we have two couplings that exist in our system, two types of processes that we consider at the same time and understand the relative importance, then suddenly new uh, new ideas emerge from this. And so um, this indie dark matter is indeed going to be um, will give us another example. Um, of uh, sort of being able to draw a phase diagram um, in coupling space. Okay, so uh, the idea over here is uh, is to ask whether dark matter density, uh, dark matter abundance that we observe in our universe today, can be determined by the freeze out of inverse decays. Okay, this is going to be the idea. So freeze out of inverse decays. Okay. So let's imagine uh, let's let's imagine the following setup. So imagine that I have uh, I'm going to have some uh, two particles in my dark sector. I'll call them chi. Okay, I'm going to have two particles chi and psi. And imagine that I have uh, a process of this sort. So here is psi that can decay into chi and some other uh, bath particle um, that I'll call phi. Okay, so this particle over here is a bath particle. 
and these other two particles are, um, are dark particles. Okay. Um, and so in principle, I want to think of both the decays and the inverse decays of psi going into chi phi uh, or vice versa. Okay. And imagine in addition, that I had some, I uh, have some other rapid number changing processes that are happening for, um, for, for psi. So imagine, for instance, that I have psi psi goes to phi phi, other bath particles. That's uh, a rapid process. Okay. So, um, and that's also just for this, uh, for setting the stage. So uh, imagine that uh, the mass of, so my mass of psi is larger than the mass of chi. Okay. So it's no problem. It's not in some forbidden regime. It can, uh, it can easily decay. And um, our chi is going to be the dark matter candidate that we're interested in. And uh, psi is this unstable dark particle um, that has, uh, you know, it has, in general, it can just be some number of chi's in its decay products. But the case that's easiest to work out is going to be the case where there's one. Okay, so we're going to consider this very simple decay and inverse decay, psi going to chi phi. Okay. So uh, let's write down our Boltzmann equation for uh, for the system. So here is our Boltzmann equation. Um, so the Boltzmann equation is going to look like the n dt or n dot of chi plus three n chi h. Okay. And now this is equal to so I have to take into account both the forward process and the backward process for um, psi decaying and inverse decaying, right? So if I'm if psi is decaying, I'm producing a chi particle, and if uh, and when I look at the inverse decay, I'm taking away a psi particle. And we can write this uh, in the following way. So I'll write it as the decay rate. So gamma is going to be my gamma over here is my decay rate for um, psi goes to chi phi. Okay, so this is sort of the direction that's easiest to write when I'm producing a chi from the, from the decay. And of course, the, the full rate for that is going to be the rate times uh, the number density of psi, because that's how many of them uh, are decaying. And then from detailed balance, we already know how to write the inverse process. So detailed balance tells us that whatever I'm writing over here, um, which of course has to be proportional to n chi, it better end up vanishing when we're in equilibrium. And so this tells me that I have to write over here n psi equilibrium over n chi equilibrium. Okay, so this is, uh, this is what we get from detailed balance. This, um, this, this type of equation, okay? And so uh, let's assume that these decays are happening uh, while in equilibrium. And this is uh, something that at least at our hand waving uh, estimate um, will suffice. And so uh, let's look at the freeze out condition. Okay, and we'll just uh, write this out and then we'll work through it after, um, after the break. So we'll, uh, we'll, even, uh, we'll break in one moment, um, but our freeze out condition is happening when the rate for, uh, the rate for this inverse decay is equal to Hubble, right? That's when this process is going to stop happening. So we're waiting for our rate, because this is this is what we're interested in. Asking can the inverse decay be the process that's freezing out, and if so, what properties of dark matter is it telling us? So we want the rate of the inverse decay to be of order Hubble. Okay. And so what we're going to do together um, after the break is write this rate for the inverse decay um, compared to Hubble, and we're going to work out. What is, um, what is the mass coupling relationship in this case? What kind of dark matter properties are we, um, are we, pointing, are we, are we pointed to? Um, and then uh, that'll sort of conclude our last piece of uh, the mechanisms, different topologies um, that, uh, that one can, that people have thought of um, so far, hopefully give you a, a good sense of uh, where people haven't thought and what's, um, what's new for you to do. Okay, so I think this is a good point to, to pause um, and we'll take, Unless there are any questions, uh, we'll take a 15 minute break and uh, reconvene on the hour. Okay, thanks uh, Thanks everyone for joining back. Um, before we continue with Indy, I just wanna say, um, I maybe I should have given the warning at the beginning of, of, uh, of the first half. So the cannibal stuff that we worked through and the elder stuff that we worked through in a way is, even though it's not that it's difficult, it's maybe like a little bit more complicated than everything else that we've done, which has actually been really simple. So if you felt like you got lost at any stage over there, I hope that you that you were able to follow through. Um, and if not, if you if you did feel like you get lost, 
Um, so A, look through the notes again. Um, and if there are any questions, definitely um, you can either email me or we can discuss it um, in our uh, discussion session tomorrow afternoon. Um, but from the flip side of that is if I did lose you at Cannibals or at Elders, I hope that you'll jump back in now um, for Indies because this is uh, this should be uh, uh, a simpler um, a simpler scenario. Okay, so don't don't be discouraged if you did um, lose me at parts um, at parts earlier, and and if you did, I'm I'm happy in, in the future to help uh, to help bring you up to pace on that. Um, okay, so uh, let's continue with our indie dark matter, our freeze out of inverse decays, and I realize I actually forgot to give you the reference for this. So this is um, actually work that we recently put out with one of our incredible students, Ronnie Frumkin. Um, so this is work that I did also with uh, Kaflik and with Hitoshi Moriyama. And we've uh, just submitted this to PRL yesterday, but here's the archive number 2111.14857 if you want to read um, uh, more details, okay? So um, I remind you what we're talking about is, can the freeze out of inverse decays of dark matter be responsible for the relic abundance. This is the question that we've uh, that we've posed, and this is the process that we're um, that we're considering. And we've written out the Boltzmann equation, and now we're ready to work through the freeze out condition. Okay, so freeze out is roughly going to happen when the rate of the process that we're interested in exploring, the inverse decays, is of order Hubble. So let's write out um, our two sides over here. Okay, so the rate for our inverse decay. Okay, so this is the rate. Looking back at this process, what this means is we're talking about the chi phi, so the inverse decay direction is this one. Um, this is their inverse decay, right? Where chi and phi are uh, are inverse decaying into psi. So that's uh, the direction that we're interested in. So this is chi and phi that are inverse decaying into psi. And so um, our Boltzmann equation is uh, what we've used from our detailed balance. That's basically telling us what we have is. It's this, uh, it's this term over here. Oops, I lost my color, okay? So it's this term. Uh, the second term is our description of the inverse decay, which we've described via detailed balance. And so let's just write out what this equals to. So this equals to, right? So again, I asked myself, I'm a chi particle. Let me remind you, here I am, I'm a chi particle. So all the rest is who I need to meet times the rate at which this is happening. And so what we have over here is that the rate for the inverse decay is the rate for the regular decay times n psi equilibrium over n chi equilibrium. Okay, and this should be, we're requiring this to be freezing out at Hubble. So that's equal to t squared over m Planck. t squared over m Planck, we're gonna use our variable x. Let me remind you that x is mass over temperature. So we have here m chi squared over x freeze out squared over m Planck, okay? And so now let's take a look at um, the two pieces that go into our into our rate. Okay, so we have this ordinary decay, and let me um, let me parameterize that in the following way. So here is this here is this decay rate. I'm just going to write this as um, again. This is just a parameterization to parameterize this blob that we're agnostic to how it's happening exactly right now. So a decay rate roughly goes like the mass of the particle. I'm gonna neglect the phase space of the over a pi times the coupling, okay? So let's roughly write this as m chi times some coupling, which is a decay coupling, I'll call it alpha decay. Okay, this is my parametrization of the, um, of the decay rate. And now let's take a look at the second component that we have over here, which is this ratio of number densities in equilibrium. So let's go, um, let's go to that piece. So n psi equilibrium over n chi equilibrium. Okay, so that's this piece over here and let's um, let's work through this. So if these particles, if everything is non-relativistic and we can, uh, as a consistency check, uh, verify that this is indeed the case. So when things are non-relativistic, does anybody remember what happens to number densities? It is exponentially suppressed. Great, they're exponentially suppressed. And because this is the ratio of number densities of a psi particle to a chi particle, and what's going to be important is we're going to have an exponential of the mass difference. Okay, so this is going to look like, um, you know, roughly m psi over m chi. This is a prefactor to the factor of three halves. We're, we're not really going to care about the prefactors. I'm going to drop them momentarily. What's important is we have an exponential of minus m psi minus m chi over temperature. Okay, and so let me denote, let me give a name to this mass difference to a normalized mass difference. I'll call it delta. It's going to be m psi 
minus m chi, and I'll just normalize it already to the dark matter mass. And so this roughly goes like one plus delta to the three halves power. And again, we're gonna drop this momentarily times e to the minus delta x. Okay, so this is our number density. Okay, so let's, uh, our number density ratio. And let's plug this all into our freeze out. So I have decay rate, which is m chi times alpha decay. Okay, times what well, we just got, one plus delta to the power of three halves e to the minus delta x. And I'm requiring this to equal Hubble, which we said is m chi squared over x freeze out squared m Planck. Okay. And the idea that we do over here, um, this is just giving you a different version of the trick of uh, uh, of how we uh, of how uh, like a trick or a method for um, for quickly getting a, a good back of the envelope estimate. What we're going to do from this equation is solve for x, or more accurately, we're just going to solve for e to the minus x. Okay, because that's going to be something we're going to be able to plug in afterwards and relate to the number density of dark matter that we've observed. So the idea over here is we're now going to solve for e to the minus x. Okay. And so this is what we get when we do that. Um, okay, so I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be sloppy now with following these prefactors. I'm just going to care about um, you know the I'm going to care about factors of delta appearing in an exponent and things like that. So if you just shuffle around, you get e to the minus x, and this is of course all happening at freeze out. So let me add that little sub index xf. So e to the minus xf scales over here, like m chi over. Um, I'm going to drop the factors of xf over here because I'm not consistent with them. M Planck times alpha decay to the one over delta. Okay, all I've done is uh, drop factors of xf and um, uh, they weren't in the exponent, and uh, uh, I just taken uh, uh, shifted around the size. Okay, and so we have e to the minus xf. And why did I want to solve for e to the minus xf? Because now what I can do is use again, assuming instantaneous freeze out, um, which is an approximation, which at zeroth order for uh, for many cases is is okay. Let's use the equilibrium distribution for the number density of chi at freeze out, and then compare that, and that's going to have an e to the minus xf in it. And compare that to what we know from our back of the envelope estimate, the relic abundance Nx at freeze out should be, which was carrying that power of, of T equality. Okay, so let me just write that out in case, in case what I said wasn't clear. So now, I'm sorry, the screen got big, okay. So now we're gonna use an equilibrium distribution for N chi at freeze out. Okay, and then we're also, going to demand that this equilibrium distribution for n chi at freeze out, which is going to use this exponential, this should equal our back of the envelope um, that we've derived, where n chi scaled like m squared times t equality. Okay, this was that, um, that back of the envelope uh, result that we were using consistently um, in our class together yesterday. So let's, um, let's put this in. So n chi, the equilibrium distribution, is going to scale like m chi squared to the 3 halves e to the minus x, okay? And what I'm going to do is take this e to the minus x that we derived up here and put that into this, okay? And then I'm going to require that this equals um, the n chi that's related to, um, um, to the measured quantity. So this is going to equal m squared times t equality. Okay, and so all you have to do now is shuffle around these sides and what you find if you do this, um, hopefully I've done this properly, is that m scales like alpha decay to the one over one plus delta power times t equality to the power of delta times m Planck, all of this to the one over one plus delta, okay? So if the inverse decay of dark matter is the process that's freezing out and is responsible for the relic abundance that we've observed in our universe today, this is the relationship that should happen between the mass of the dark matter and the decay constant and the, um, the, um, the coupling uh, of the decay, okay? And so this is, uh, this is what we call, um, this is what we've called uh, Indy dark matter where Indy is short for inverse decays. And um, just, you can note already, so this is this even more generalized weird geometric mean, right? So if I look, for instance, if I plug, if delta equals one, 
then in terms of the scaling of t equality and what you know what um uh what not square root but like what root of t equality m plank i'm getting i'm actually reproducing something that's very wimp like and if delta equals two i get something that's very um similar to simp in terms of scaling but importantly if i have small mass splittings okay delta doesn't have to equal one or two delta could be anything um, if i have small mass splittings let me actually write this in another color so oops so for small mass splittings Um, let's say, you know, delta smaller than one, then what's happening in this ge generalized geometric mean now is that if I want to ask, okay, for the same mass as I would have had for these other cases that we've discussed, I'm now going to have a much smaller coupling, or alternatively, I'm going to have a larger mass for the same coupling, okay? So um, I either get over here small mass for same coupling, or alternatively, a large mass for sort of the same ballpark of couplings. And what this actually then gives us the ability to do is a way to work towards heavy dark matter, okay? So this can give us heavy dark matter, heavier than, um, than, uh, than sort of the, uh, the, comparable, uh, uh, the comparable couplings in other mechanisms that we've, um, that we've discussed. And in particular, we believe that there are ways to go significantly um, above the unitarity bound, even using um, interactions of this sort, not just other interactions that have existed um, so far in the literature. Okay, and so this is um, this is the picture for inverse decay dark matter for ND dark matter. Now, um, as I kind of alluded to uh, earlier today, and even uh, if you guys let's take a step back. Oh yeah, there's a question, Sergio. Sergio, you have a question. Uh, I, I see a raised hand by, by Sergio. You hear me now? Yes. Yeah, we hear you now. Uh, when, you, when you mean um, uh, small mass, when you say small mass for same coupling, did you not mean small coupling for same mass? Uh, yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you passed the test. I wasn't meaning to put any test, but I appreciate that. Exactly. Small, thank you so much. So small coupling for same mass or large mass for same couplings. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, okay, so uh, if you remember yesterday, um, yesterday when we when we talked about co-annihilations, um, then I said, okay, co-annihilations was the case where we had some tower of, uh, right, we have some tower of particle that's in chemical contact with itself. And I don't care about how it's in chemical contact. And I said, maybe it's in chemical contact because it has, um, you know, it's elastically scattering with itself, or maybe it's decaying and inverse decaying. All I needed was something that was sort of uh, giving me this um, this uh, this chemical uh, chemical contact within the tower. And I sort of, uh, I drew a circle, I think, around that, that decay. And I said, just keep this guy in mind because we're gonna come back to it tomorrow. Um, and so we're at that point now, okay? So uh, um, what I wanna point out is that actually, um, more than just that we've uh, now discovered a, a new candidate for dark matter, a new mechanism, which we've called Indy, I wanna point out that we actually have now um, found a new phase diagram, okay, in, uh, in coupling space. So let me show you uh, what I mean by this. So if you look back um, very early on over here, sorry for scrolling, at the very beginning of Indy, I had this, uh, this kind of sentence sitting here in parentheses where um, we said that I'm also assuming that Psi is, uh, is just sort of rapidly annihilating, um, annihilating away. And so uh, what I want us to take a moment and look at is these two processes sort of uh, sitting next to each other, okay? So I have here two processes where um, here's psi that is um, going to chi and phi back and forth. And this is a process that's controlled by some coupling, which I called alpha decay, okay? And in addition, I have um, some process over here where psi's are annihilating into phi's, and let's say that this is controlled by some alpha annihilation. Okay, some other, uh, some other coupling. Okay, so uh, as it turns out, if we look at the relative size between these two couplings, at the relative size between the importance of these processes, we actually uh, have a phase, a very interesting phase space. So let's look at this, um, at this, 
uh, FS phase diagram. So here, here it is. Here it is. Um, let me do it. So I'll down here, I'll do alpha decay. So this is the decays and inverse decay processes. And up here, I'll have alpha annihilations. And it turns out that as we vary the, uh, the ratio or the importance, the size of these two couplings, something very interesting happens. We actually end up with a phase diagram that looks like this. So let me explain what's going on over here. So down in this, uh, we sort of have these two branches of, uh, of this uh, parameter space, if you will. So on this uh, horizontal branch down here, okay, in this region, um, this is a region that is actually very similar to co-annihilation. Okay, so what I mean by that is that this is a region that you see, I can, once alpha decay is large enough, so that the decays and inverse decays are giving me chemical contact, um, its precise value doesn't mean anything anymore. And to get the right relic abundance, the only thing that matters was what is the value of alpha annihilation. So this is exactly the case where chi, who's my dark matter particle, its relic abundance is being set by the annihilations of a completely different process, a completely different particle, psi, but because it's in chemical contact with it, the fact that psi is annihilating away means that it's reducing the number density of chi as well. Okay, so this is the region of co-annihilation where the, um, the abundance of chi is set by the annihilations of psi, okay? So this is exactly, um, this is exactly that regime that we discussed yesterday in co-annihilations where we said that the relic abundance of the dark matter could be determined completely by a process that's happening, some, some annihilation or some number changing process that's happening for a completely different particle, okay? So this is uh, one phase of this uh, two process um, phase space, okay? And because chi and psi are in chemical equilibrium with each other through decays and inverse decays, then, um, then we're uh, predicting the relic abundance of dark matter and determining it. Okay, so what's happening over here is that um, chi and psi are in chemical equilibrium via these decays and inverse decays, okay? But let's also take a look at this uh, other phase that we have over here. And this is the phase, oops, so this phase uh, over here is the phase of indie dark matter. Okay, so if the decay, uh, once the annihilation coupling is so strong, then just basically psi is immediately decay, psi is immediately annihilate into phi's, okay? And then its precise value doesn't matter. And the only thing that's mattering is what is the value of alpha decay? So this is the case in which the relic abundance is being set by the inverse decay process, okay? So this is the region that we've just worked out together where we have freeze out of inverse decays. So by considering a new regime of the relative strength of these two couplings, we were able to uncover a new mechanism for dark matter, a new candidate for dark matter. But actually, these are just different phases of a more broad um, uh, coupling parameter space. Okay. So uh, this concludes the last piece of uh, the last mechanism that I wanted us to um, uh, to talk to uh, to talk about together and to work through. Um, so. The next thing we're gonna to move to is uh, talking about some model building and moving to talk about dark sectors. Um, but I'll pause over here in case there are any questions about Indies or any of the other mechanisms that we've discussed together. Okay. There is a question in the ah, chat. Okay, great. Sorry, didn't look at the chat, okay. Uh, super wimps are not. I think they're not. Uh, uh, they're not thermal. So what? What do you mean? The difference between what and what? Um, like difference with the. Uh, I need to compare and contrast. Um, nothing that we've discussed here together are uh, are super wimps. He's asking the difference between indie and super wimps. Ah, well, these so indies are thermal. So this is what I want to point. These are thermal relics. Okay. So there have been processes, there are several processes, um, mechanisms that people have discussed that involve inverse decays. Um, Friesen, uh, which I gave us a reference to at the beginning, um, at the beginning of um, the very beginning of today's whiteboard, um, is another example where uh, decay, where inverse decays are populating the dark matter and determining the abundance, but it's not a thermal relic. So it's really important to ask yourself, what are my initial conditions? Do I have dependence on initial conditions? Am I thermal relic or not thermal relic? 
um, these, these things make a difference in terms of uh, understanding what's the parameter space. Um, so they really are distinct, uh, distinct mechanisms from, from each other. Sansink, do you, you also have a question? I see your, your hand is raised. Yes, uh, actually, I cannot find what the what what if the the line line in alpha annihilation and alpha decay. I mean, I cannot find what if the mean the meaning of the the line of the clip. The black part. Yes. Okay, so this is this is a curve um, that's showing you. Uh, to obtain the right dark matter relic abundance in the presence of these two couplings, okay, um, what, what needs to happen? And so you see that there are two very distinct regimes. There are two phases or branches of this theory. Um, and the one, your, one region is the horizontal region where you don't, the value of alpha decay doesn't mean anything anymore. No matter, you see, alpha decay can just go on and on and on. And what is that value? It's not what's determining. What's determining the relic abundance is alpha annihilation. Okay, so that's the regime where, where we're in a co-annihilating state, um, where the chemical contact is being maintained through decays and inverse decays. So once the alpha decay is large enough, it's giving us that chemical contact, and then we don't care anymore about what it is. It's The relic abundance is being determined by alpha annihilation. From the flip side, on this vertical branch, which is the indie dark matter branch, um, we're in a regime where the annihilations are so fast that as soon as you know, as soon as you're producing a psi, psi's are just rapidly going into into phi's, and then you don't even care how quickly that's happening. Once it's happening fast enough, all you care about is that psi is the is the inverse decay. So what is the size of that inverse decay? That is what's going to determine your relic abundance. So this is this is uh, the question is you know is what's setting your relic abundance? Oops, sorry about that. Um, which of these couplings or which of these processes is the thing that's determining the relic abundance and is the thing that's um, that's freezing out? And and in fact, I'll just say that actually within this parameter space, as I just said, there are actually many more phases that um, that exist depending on other other details, um, looking at very different regimes of these couplings. So if I look at super 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 tiny decay couplings, for instance, then I can enter basically the Friesen um, the Friesen regime. I'm just not drawing that here because that's the that's sort of a regime that's been studied in the past. Um, and it requires, it also has some dependence on initial conditions. And so, um, um, so that's sort of a different, um, a bit of a different story. But, but what, I, what I hope you take from this type of, um, this type of discussion um, of what we've been seeing together is that, as we said, it's sometimes there's an interesting one process that you can think of that nobody's thought of before. But very often also you can take processes that somebody's thought of, join it with another process and you might discover something completely new or maybe a combination of new processes that you're putting together and maybe you're gonna discover something, again, something that's very distinct and new from them. So I think that sort of that keeping, keeping that open mind in terms of what are processes that people have thought of, not thought of, what combinations, I think there's a lot of interesting physics that's still um, sitting over there and we're really just at the beginning of sort of mapping out this, um, this very broad um, phase space um, of a sort of phase diagram of what dark matter can and can't be. Okay. Yeah, I've got it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Leonardo. Uh, hi, thank you for uh, the lectures. Uh, my question has to do with uh, N effective in relation to the SIMP uh, paradigm mm -hmm. specifically. So uh, when we talked about the, the necessity to effectively couple the uh, uh, dark matter particles to standard model bath in order to effectively dump uh, its entropy away, wouldn't that affect an effective and therefore wouldn't there be any constraints from uh, precision cosmology? Yeah, so absolutely there are. We haven't gotten yet to discussing constraints. I've just sort of been giving you, I've, I've been mentioning some lower bounds on masses. So for SIMPs, I don't remember if I actually said this or wrote this explicitly. For, for SIMPs, the mass range that, at least for the scenario that we've, um, as we've described it, indeed the mass range is uh, roughly bounded to be above an MeV, exactly for the reason that you just said, because I, I, you know, uh, bounds from N effective, which we're going to be discussing in detail tomorrow, um, amongst other constraints, um, they certainly set, they, they absolutely um, place a limit. And that means that I can't go as low as I would want. I can't just say, okay, let me take this self coupling to really be very small. I really am pointed to sort of this, um, um, a regime in which the, the coupling is actually fairly strong because I do have a constraint on the mass. And there are even additional constraints on the mass that turn out to even be stronger than that. So we're gonna work through some of those um, together tomorrow. But you're absolutely right that, that that's a constraint that one has to certainly take care of. 
Great, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, uh, any further questions? Yeah, Emanuele. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you briefly mentioned the uh, caveat of unitarity. Uh, can you uh, elaborate a little bit on this? Because I see that this dark matter mass, I mean, we have annihilations with psi particles and they are uh, heavier than the chi particles that, uh, for instance, yeah, they, they go with this one over delta, uh, alpha annihilation one over delta. We can go very at very large masses. But I expect that this the cross section on of the psi annihilations will be bounded by unitarity. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So so absolutely. Um, I didn't mean that that we don't bound psi the psi annihilations by unitarity. We of course do, and there um, but there are ways. So I'll say two things. The first is that in terms of if I think of where am I going to chop. So let me choose some uh, some different color here. Um, let's go for blue. Okay. You know, how far up do I go with alpha annihilation is certainly something that uh, in this parametrization, you would ca cap off by what is the unitarity bound on this cross section. And if there's no nothing fancy going on, you know, there's no resonances or whatever, it's probably four pi. Um, but maybe you have, uh, you sit on a resonance, there, there are ways to enhance it further. What I meant by unitarity is not that I, I, not that I ever violate unitarity, but when I'm talking about going beyond the unitarity limit, what I mean is, different tricks and ways that are not even that tricky, I think is, is really the key, in which the naive bound that you would think by just saying, oh, for this effective coupling, I've bounded it by four pi, and that would tell me a maximum mass, for instance, um, ways to get around, to get heavier masses than what, that, than what that would imply. So I'm never violating unitarity. That would be a very big, uh, that's a very big no-no. Um, but uh, I just mean ways to get beyond what people call the unitarity limit. And that's through understanding interesting combinations of processes that, um, that actually can feed into the fact that this, uh, this these sort of naive analyses of what is the unitarity limit are actually um, fairly naive. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. Um, so I, I'd recommend, for instance, an interesting paper you could look at um, so I didn't have a chance to, to talk about the, I just sort of briefly mentioned when we talked about WIMPs and I mentioned the unitarity limit there, which is around 300 TV. And I mentioned already two recent papers just from the last couple of years that go beyond the unitarity limit. Um, one of them was the zombies and the other one was a nearest neighbor chain. So I'd recommend reading, for instance, the nearest neighbor chain paper um, to sort of understand how you can, um, how you can, how a combination of processes enables you to go while maintaining unitarity beyond the unitarity limit. And similarly for the zombie case. Okay. Yeah. Tim? Uh, just to make sure I understood the Indy correctly. So we basically start with a thermal mass of psi's, chi's, and phi's. And uh, the chi's and phi's do the inverse decay to psi, but psi decays mostly to uh, phi. And at some point, uh, the rate of the inverse decay uh, gets uh, of order of the Hubble and decouples, all psi's decay to phi's, and we end up with a constant chi density that is our dark matter particle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. I'll just mention if uh, if you're interested in the there's a little bit of a nuance over here. If I think of what is the th what does the picture of freeze out look like, it does still. If I was drawing it, look like all the pictures that we've been been drawing. It's sort of that level of uh, um, of the big picture. Um, whether or not it maintains a thermal, thermal contact throughout the entire time before it freezes out depends on certain, certain things. And you can uh, take a look at, uh, we have a, a whole bunch of plots um, if you're interested in this, uh, in this recent paper that show um, to, what extent, um, to what extent, assuming that the decays and inverse decays are happening in, in, a, in thermal equilibrium uh, is true or not true, but as a, as a broad brush, this is, uh, this, is, this is correct. But if you want to look at, at some more details, then, um, then I recommend reading the details in the paper. And I'm, of course, happy also to discuss it further in the discussion session tomorrow. OK, thanks. OK. Any other questions before we start dark sectorizing? OK, wait, I see something. Anything in the chat that's still, uh, OK. Great. OK, so um, we're going to move on now to uh, talking about some dark sectors. OK, so let's delve into dark sectors. So until now, what we've been doing together is, um, as we said, we've been developing mechanisms. OK, so we've developed 
mechanisms and we've understood the behavior what i mean by that is you know we've 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 parameterized these mechanisms in terms of masses and couplings right so we've understood relationships between mass and coupling etc and what we're now going to sort of move on to do is um, understand models. And when I say models, what I mean by this are particular theories that realize these mechanisms. Okay, so just uh, to mention, for instance, two examples of models that you're already familiar with. I'm sure um, you've perhaps heard in your life of supersymmetry, which we've also mentioned already here. So supersymmetry is really the poster child for WIMP dark matter or for co-annihilating dark matter. So this is the poster child for um, WIMPs or for co-annihilations. Um, and uh, we've also already seen in the context of our SIMP, uh, our SIMP mechanism, I wrote down a toy Z3 model. Again, that's a model that realizes the mechanism. So uh, let's just write that down. We saw a toy Z3 for our three to two simp. Okay, so these are example of models that, um, uh, example of what I mean by models. And what I want to um, to sort of convey to you uh, when we discuss now dark sectors is that these mechanisms that we've uh, really, all of these mechanisms that we've been, uh, that we've described and we've, uh, and we've understood are really generic in theory land. Okay, these mechanisms are generic in theory land. Okay, so let's um, let's see how this how this happens. Okay, so let's talk about some dark sector zoos. Okay, now what do I mean by by a zoo over here? I mean that we have over here. So here's our standard model sector. Okay. Um, which we uh, you know which we know and love. And if we look at the standard model itself. It's, uh, as I mentioned yesterday in the discussion session, this is not, you know, just one, one particle or two particle. We really have a whole zoo of particles. So we have a zoo of particles. Um, and they're not just, you know, running wild, but they're governed by a symmetry structure. We have a symmetry structure, right? We have our beautiful SU3 color cross SU2 uh, weak cross U1 hypercharge, okay? And so you can ask yourself, you know, here's my dark sector. DS is going to be my dark sector. Um, why shouldn't this happen or something similar? Why couldn't something similar happen in the dark sector too? So why not in the dark sector too, okay? Maybe there's a whole new zoo of particles and maybe they're also governed by some new symmetry structure. So maybe there's some new gauge symmetry that's governing how everything uh, how everything is happening okay and so um, uh, uh, and of course uh, um, you know it could be and, and maybe there's also some ways as we said for these two um, dark set for this dark sector and the standard model to speak to itself okay and so i um, sort of taking inspiration from the standard model inspired inspired by the standard model um, let's imagine for instance you know maybe uh, maybe what we have is uh, an SU3 dark, okay? Maybe we have some dark version of, uh, of QCD. Um, and in fact, it doesn't even have to be so QCD-like. We could really think not just of, you know, a dark SU3, but we could more generally think of some uh, dark SUN with some number of colors. So SUNC, maybe an SO gauge theory with NC colors, or maybe an SP. And C gauge group, okay. All of these are um, uh, are stuff that we could be thinking about, um, and so these are um, um, so these are sort of uh, these types of theories over here. These are just theories of dynamical chiral symmetry breaking, or just strongly coupled gauge theories, okay. So strongly coupled gauge theories. Um, so these are just QCD like theories, um, which I'll collectively kind of call dark. QCD. Okay, so when I say dark QCD, I don't mean necessarily an SU3. I just mean something that's sort of of this family, this super broad family, super generic of 
uh, uh, of gauge theories, okay? And maybe, you know, not just like, uh, uh, um, just like in the standard model, maybe we also have some, uh, maybe we also have some, just like we have the UN electromagnetism in the standard model, maybe we also have some dark U1. Okay, maybe there's also uh, um, an abelian component to this. And if we had some dark U1 of this sort, then uh, you know this would allow us in principle to have some uh, kinetically mixed, okay, then we can have some dark photon that's associated with this. And so we can have some kinetically mixed dark photon, which I'll uh, typically call um, V sometimes Sometimes, I, I don't remember if, I, I don't know if I'm gonna be sloppy about this or not, but sometimes in the literature, it's also called gamma D. So gamma is regular photon, D indicating that it's dark. So I'll be using one of these two um, notations. Um, and so the theories that we're gonna talk about, these are just theories that really resemble the standard model in many sense, but sort of make it even um, a little bit more broad, okay? So maybe sort of the simplest version of this, um, that we could think of is really, you know, forget about the SU and the SO and the SP. What if like the simplest thing is just a U1, okay? So it could be that all we have is just a dark U1. Um, so it could be just um, a dark U1. Okay, so this would be like a dark version of quantum electrodynamics with dark particles um, that are charged under it. Charged under it. So this would be maybe sort of the simplest version of, uh, of a dark sector. And because we have a dark photon, it's allowed at the renormalizable level already to kinetically mix with, um, with the ordinary photon. And so we'd have terms in the Lagrangian such as minus uh, epsilon over two times F mu nu of the regular photon, the regular photon strength times the dark photon strength. So I'll call that F prime mu nu, okay, where this epsilon is just the size of that kinetic mixing. And um, what we have, uh, uh, for instance, instead of a, you know, the regular E or fine structure constant, we're gonna have some dark version of that. So I'll call that ED. And this is giving us some dark version of the fine structure constant. And what this really just means is that if we have something like this in the simplest dark sector that we could possibly write down, we're gonna have some interactions between standard model stuff, um, which now, you know, talks to the photon and then through this epsilon now mixes into our dark photon and the dark photon talks to stuff that's charged under it. So for instance, our dark matter. And the strength over here is this ED, okay? And so in this simplest dark sector, um, this kinetic mixing gives us a way for our dark matter and our standard model already to talk to each other. Okay, so this kinetic Mixing gives us dark matter standard model ways to communicate, um, by which I mean, you know, couple um, to the standard model. So this is sort of the simplest, this is a very simple dark sector, okay? Just a dark U1. But of course, um, the dark sector doesn't have to be that simple. Um, and it could be uh, it could be com more complicated, and so we can think about adding on um, complications, which are very natural, just like we have in the standard model, including these QCD-like uh, dark sectors. Okay, so that's our simple dark sector, but the dark sector could the dark sector can be more complicated. Um, so we can talk about QCD-like dark sectors. Okay, and uh, what's really important here is that these, you know, these these types of gauge groups, these QCD-like theories, are really very rich. So we have rich theories, and that means that this is a rich playground for many dark matter mechanisms that we've discussed to, uh, or many processes to occur. Okay, so it's a rich playground for many dark matter mechanisms and processes to occur, okay? And this is true in general, like as we've just been describing when we're talking about these different, different phases inside a given theory. If you have in a particular model or given theory or a given model, you might have many processes, right? You're gonna take your Lagrangian and all of your particle content and you're gonna have all your interactions and you're gonna write down all of the different processes that could happen. 
And then depending on the relative size of the couplings and of you know everything, depending on the relative size of these processes, you might end up in different regions of your parameter space with a realization of a very different mechanism. Okay, so these are these different phases that we um, uh, that we that we saw at the mechanism level. These absolutely happen also at uh, also at the model level. Okay, and so in these QCD-like theories, um, because they're so rich, these QCD-like theories. Um, uh, you can really sort of think, uh, think of these uh, QCD-like theories just like we have in QCD itself. We're going to have a whole host of particles, and in particular, if these are strongly coupled theories, we're going to have a whole host of mesons, okay, just like we have in the standard model. So we have a host of mesons, so some dark versions of, you know, dark versions of pions, so I'll call those dark pions and dark kaons and dark rho, etc. Okay, so these are all of our dark mesons. And uh, importantly, as I'm going to show you in these theories, um, the pions, the dark pions, and I'll call collectively the pions. Um, it's going to be the name that I call sort of collectively for all of the pseudo nambu Goldstone bosons of these theories. So pseudo nambu Goldstone bosons of the theories. Um, these can play the role of dark matter. Okay. And so there are many, uh, you know, we have many mesons, uh, very rich theories. And what we're going to uh, work together tomorrow is uh, first, we're just going to, I'll give you examples of how two to two mechanisms that we've, uh, that we've worked through together can, um, uh, can, uh, can occur. Um, just sort of give you these diagrams. And then we're going to work through, uh, work through some details of also how the more complicated um, SIMPs, for instance, can, uh, can emerge in these theories. Okay. And okay, so that's, uh, I think this is a good, a good place to stop for today. Um, are there any questions? Yes, there is one. Mm -hmm. Two. Two. So go ahead. Uh, Hi, uh, I would like to no, go ahead. Okay, you first, you first. Okay, fine. And no, the question is, is very simple. So can you explain a little bit what kinetic mixing means? Because I've, I've heard it before, but I don't know what it is. Okay, so it, so it literally nice means- could tell us a little bit. Yeah, of course. So it literally means um, that I can write down, so you see this term that we have here, this Lagrangian term, okay? I'm allowed, if I have two abelian uh, field strengths, okay? The one for the photon, the one for the uh, for the kinetically mixed hidden photon. Um, I'm allowed to write down a term of this sort, right? This term obeys its its uh, the the field strength is neutral under each of these symmetries. Um, it's completely Lorentz contracted. It's a Lorentz scalar. You know, every everything is fine. It's completely kosher, and it's a renormalizable interaction, right? If I look at the what's the dimension of the coupling epsilon, it's zero, right? So I can there's no problem to write down this uh, this interaction. So it's a renormalizable coupling that couples between these two field strengths, okay? Now, of course, uh, what this means is that now my, uh, the basis that I worked in isn't really uh, necessarily a good, uh, uh, a good basis and you will diagonalize, et cetera. But if this epsilon is very, very small as it typically will be from constraints, um, then it just gives you this, uh, it gives you this portal exactly like we've drawn over here where effectively the photon mixes into the dark photon. Okay, and so this just gives you a way um, Again, and you can make this more uh, rigorous by literally moving to to the diagonalized proper um, degrees of freedom, but you end up with uh, you know this picture suffices for for basically anything you're going to be interested in doing, um, where you have this mixing between the photon and the dark photon, and it basically gives you a portal for these two sectors um, to interact with uh, with each other. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yes. And importantly, this is also, you know, there, there's an aspect in which this is kind of technically natural because as I take epsilon, you know, if I take epsilon to zero, my two sectors are completely decoupled from each other. Okay, so there's, um, it's, this is really sort of the only way in which they're, um, in which they're speaking to each other, and it's a very, it's, a, it's attractive because there are many, um, you know, it's, it's something that just naturally you can have if you have a, a dark U1 or any other new U1. Okay, so that, just like a small uh, follow up. So, in, in essence, if you add an additional U1 uh, symmetry, you have to, in some way, 
the most general Lagrangian will have kinetic mixing, right? The most, if you write the most general Lagrangian, you will have to add this term necessar necessarily. Yes, right? yes, yeah. If I have a new gauge symmetry, yeah, if I follow the rules that, you know, if my rules are, give me, I write down every single term in my renormalizable theory that's allowed, then I have this. And as we're going to see, there are, of course, constraints. This is, uh, this is a very popular type of, uh, of portal. Um, again, we've seen it here in the most simple dark sector, but it's going to be, you'll see it's going to naturally arise also as a sort of component in, any, um, in many other, um, other more complicated, more rich scenarios that we'll be talking about. And there are constraints on how large this coupling can be. And we know that it's, um, uh, for the most part, constrained to be fairly small, but it's, um, it's a big target for many, many different techniques and frontiers for experiments to try to search for. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions? Uh, I have one. Uh, mm -hmm. What I mm, have three. Why do we make a, a, make a connecting mixing between between dark photon and photon? Why not fermion? Why not we could could we consider some connecting connecting mixing between dark fermion and just standard model fermion? There's certainly so to be clear. I'm by no means saying that this is the only way, that this is the only portal through which to couple dark sectors to the standard model. That is absolutely not what, I, what I'm saying. I'm just saying if I take the simplest dark sector or an example of a very simple dark sector inspired by the gauge symmetries that we see in the standard model of a U1, then you naturally have this portal. The ones that we're going to be working through together next are going to be generally these SU or SO or SP gauge theories where we have uh, a lot of uh, richness and a lot of things that we can do with them and a lot of mechanisms that can occur. There's certainly other portals that one can write down different types of coupling. So there, there's no, there's no um, like a priori way to tell you, oh, something that you can or can't do. One thing that you do obviously have to always make sure if you're coupling a dark sector where you're claiming you have a dark matter particle to the standard model, you of course wanna make sure that your dark matter remains stable. Um, but having said that, you know, other than that, write down your theory, write down all the couplings that you want to try, move to the correct degrees of freedom um, and, uh, you know, to the canonical degrees of freedom and work out what constraints, et cetera, et cetera, you have. So this is by no means the only way to do it. It's just the first one that I've shown you. Uh, uh, so you mean, you meant the, the, why that the, why that is the most simplest one is uh, just to be, just to because it is quite simple to out of out of it, how to say. Maybe as yeah, I don't want you to attach too much meaning to my word simple. Uh, what I what I just mean is that within this category that I'm talking about, all about let me be inspired by the standard model and introduce new gauge symmetries. It's certainly the simplest of the gauge symmetries, just one u one. Okay. Um, it doesn't mean that I couldn't invent one dark matter particle and couple it in a particular way. That's not that's not what I'm insinuating. This is just. Uh, a simple and in the context of these gauge symmetries, it's the simplest. Uh -huh. I've got it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. But may maybe I'll just add to that that certainly, if it, what let's say you come up with some new mechanism, um, it doesn't mean that the easiest way to write down a toy model is necessarily this way. What I'm trying to show you from the flip side is just looking at this very broad class, a super generic class of theories. We're going to see how many of these dark matter mechanisms just naturally happen within them. So that's the direction that I'm showing you. It doesn't necessarily mean that for every dark matter mechanism, this is necessarily the simplest way. I'm trying to show you from the flip side, within theory land, all of these mechanisms that we've been discussing are really just natural, uh, natural habituants in, uh, in in these theories. Okay. Any further questions? Uh, I see one in the chat. I don't know if you can read it. Uh, let me see. It's the non-abelian kinetic mixing. Um, well, that uh, that a little bit depends. I can't uh, don't know exactly how to do that off the top of my head. That doesn't mean that it's not possible. Let me think a little bit on that and and get back to you. Um, what you're going to see, um, what we'll see together tomorrow, is actually how even if I take um, if I just take my non-abelian theories. Um, there's a way to gauge subgroups of them such that I'm basically I'm going to end up with a kinetic mixing with the U1 kinetic mixing. So I don't have to go to very fancy um, to very fancy versions. You can think of other fancier versions. They're just um, they're going to be sort of sitting outside of uh, of what we're going to be doing together. Okay. Okay. So thanks so much, everyone.
Okay, thanks. So uh, before we close the connection, let me remind everybody to uh, share the picture on Slack in case you haven't done so. Yes, please continue to post. I see that uh, we have like an increase of uh, pictures, but they're uh, far from being the number of, to be equal to the number of participants. Okay. Very good. Do it for Diego. Okay. Yeah, do it for me. <laughs> and uh, then, uh, so we reconvene at 2.30 with exactly. gravitational waves. Huh? And uh, there is no discussion session today. So the next one and the last one will be tomorrow. So for the rest of the day, we only have the gravitational wave lectures. Very okay. Good. See you later. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.